As the creators of the most recognizable starfighter in the Star Wars galaxy, the Incom Corporation played a vital role in the events of the Galactic Civil War. Their excellent designs and rebellious tendencies shaped the galaxy in ways that most companies could only dream of, granting them a spot in the Starship Manufacturing Hall of Fame. <laughs> The Incom Corporation started out as a parts manufacturer, specializing in high-end repulsor lift technology. They were the company responsible for the massive repulsor lifts that hold up the floating jewel of Bespin, Cloud City. This massive project kept the company in the black for years, but eventually, Incom's directors decided that repulsor lifts were just too narrow a market, and they wanted to take a crack at making a few other things, so the company began to transition. First, they leveraged their expertise in repulsors by making airspeeders and other atmospheric craft, which they got very good at. Then they moved in on the Starfighter market. The company saw limited success with their first few Starfighters before partnering with the small Trandoshan manufacturer, Subpro. With their help, Incom was able to design its first few mildly successful planetary defense fighters, and eventually their first monumental success, the Z-95 Headhunter. As the Clone Wars took off though, Incom left Subpro behind their former partner's Trandoshan ownership providing an easy excuse to break their contracts, given the political climate at the time. Incom kept ownership of the joint designs during the separation, and began manufacturing fighters for the Republic Navy at large scale. And what a large scale it was. Even though Incom only had two starfighters in active use by the Republic Navy, the Republic's enormous hunger for fighters meant Incom's manufacturing lines were kept running at maximum capacity for the last two years of the war. Even the newly built production lines. So at the end of the Clone Wars, Incom was at its height. They had made a ton of money, had tons of assets, and had a ton of prestige thanks to their very, very successful starfighter designs. Plus, with the formation of the Galactic Empire, it seemed like galactic-scale starfighter contracts were just going to keep being a thing for a long time, and Incom assumed they were on the short list for who was going to be getting those contracts. Times were good, until they weren't. Incom's CEO wasn't exactly an outspoken critic of the new Imperial regime, but they were resistant. For one thing, Incom employed a lot of non-humans. Not for any political reasons, mind you, just because Incom wanted the best employees they could get for the cheapest price they could get them, and that happened to include a lot of non-human candidates. But the Empire didn't really care about the why, they were just unhappy the company wasn't falling in line with Imperial standards. Plus, Incom's designs were expensive. Not the kind of expensive that makes a design untenable from an economic perspective, but the kind of expensive that doesn't leave any room in its budget for kickbacks, bribes. There's one bribe for the nut, another for the bolt. Andy, Andy, listen to me, this is an expensive proposition. And so, Incom's designs were rejected for Imperial service, with the contracts instead going to Sinar Fleet Systems, who was more than willing to follow the party line and whose TIE Fighter project left more than enough room in its budget to grease the wheels and the pockets of all the necessary procurement officials. This left Incom out in the cold, but they dealt with these kinds of setbacks before, and they could do it again. Sure, the Empire had pissed them off, and they were going to spend the next decade getting them back for it, but that came second to making sure the company survived. And they were just about making that happen when the next shoe dropped. The Empire was nationalizing the company. This wasn't targeted specifically at Encom. The Empire was nationalizing all defense companies that weren't explicitly aligned with the Emperor's vision. But it was the last push that Encom needed. All of the best designers and engineers at Incom already hated the Empire for ideological and personal reasons, and they had only been playing nice in an effort to keep their company alive. But it seemed the Empire was determined to take that from them too. So the designers decided to make the Empire pay for it. Using their Senate contacts, the group reached out to the Rebel Alliance and offered to defect, bringing with them the designs, specifications, and prototypes of their newest and most deadly starfighter, the X-Wing. The Alliance of course agreed, and a plan was put in motion. The Encom engineers would make sure the prototype X-Wings would be sent to the relatively remote world of Frisia, where the Rebel Raiding Force would be able to steal them. The engineers would then deliver all of the documentation necessary for clandestine production of the fighters to Rebel agents, and then they themselves would defect, bringing their massive amount of experience over to the Rebel side. The plan worked, mostly. Rebel forces were able to steal the X-Wing prototypes without too much difficulty, although Captain Antilles might disagree with that characterization, and the Rebel agents were able to secure the design documentation as well, allowing the Alliance to produce their own X-Wings with relative ease. However, before the Incom defectors were able to make their escape, 
they were captured by the ISB and sent to die in the spice mines of Kessel. Lucky for them, the rebel fleet was able to intercept the Imperial convoy carrying the Encom staff and, using ion weapons, rescue them. So Incom joined the Rebel Alliance, or at least their best did. Technically, Incom as a whole was actually nationalized by the Empire as planned, and those designers who did not defect were set about the menial task of creating aggressively average starfighters designed for planetary defense purposes on Imperial member worlds. Fighters like the I-7 Hellrunner, a short-range fighter with similar performance characteristics to the TIE Fighter, but with a much smaller profile and a shield generator. It wasn't a bad fighter, it could have even been a preferable replacement for the TIE Fighter if it wasn't for its high cost of 165,000 credits and the fact that Incom was decidedly unpopular with the Empire after that whole defection thing. The company survived though, making it all the way through the end of the Galactic Civil War and into the next era. Now let's cover some of the Incom Corporation's chief design principles, starting with the basics. Incom Starfighters were primarily designed to be all-rounders, general-purpose starfighters that could perform any role to some degree with a slight emphasis on survivability. Their fighters typically came equipped with medium to heavy primary weapons, secondary missile or torpedo weapons, decently powerful engines, and shields. Incom's designs also had an interesting shared trait in that they all had the same control setup, with only mild variations between the control interfaces of completely separate product lines. This meant if a pilot was trained on one Incom starfighter, they were theoretically capable of flying them all. And then of course, there's the S-foils. Incom had a habit of mounting the primary weapons of their fighters on wingtips, a design decision that allowed Incom to mount oversized and sometimes overpowered weapons to their fighters, without risking overheating. This is accomplished through the use of S-foils, foldable, wing-like structures that serve as massive heat sinks with the ability to be stored away during normal operations and deployed during combat situations. These foils allowed fighters to use far more energy and therefore generate far more heat than they otherwise would be able to sustain, without creating a large vulnerability like the TIE Fighter's hybrid radiator panels, and Incom loved them, featuring them prominently on both the ARC-170 and the X-Wing. Speaking of, now it's time to cover some of Incom Corporation's most iconic designs, although the one we'll be starting with is perhaps not what you would expect. When Incom decided to transition from repulsor lifts to starfighters, their first step was to move into the airspeeder market, making vehicles with performance qualities similar to starfighters but powered by repulsor lifts. These vehicles were the perfect market for Incom to get some experience in the field they wanted to enter, while leveraging their existing experience to make some excellent products. And the most excellent airspeeder they ever made was the T-16 Skyhopper. The T-16 was a two-seater, high-performance trans-orbital airspeeder. It combined one of Incom's high-performance DCJ repulsor lifts with an E-16 ion engine, giving it an absurd amount of speed and maneuverability, as well as an operational ceiling of approximately 300 kilometers, allowing it to reach just into the fringes of space. This kind of operational range also necessitated the T-16 come equipped with a pressurized cockpit, low-grade life support systems, as well as highly sophisticated controls and instrumentation. It could also be fitted with a single pneumatic cannon or repeating laser blaster, which made the vehicle attractive to small planetary defense forces and civilians alike. Additionally, due to Incom's tendency to make all their control systems the same, the T-16's controls were nearly identical to that of the X-Wing Starfighter, making the T-16 not just the perfect trainer for Incom's designers as they made their way into Starfighter production, but also the perfect trainer for young pilots in the Rebel Alliance looking to take the fight to the Empire. Of course, far before the formation of the Empire, Incom had its first breakthrough in the starfighter market, the Z-95 Headhunter. This single-seat starfighter made its way onto the galactic market over a decade before the start of the Clone Wars, and managed to stay relevant even into the midpoint of the Galactic Civil War. In its first iteration, the Z-95 was armed with two triple blaster cannons, an outdated design even at the time of the Headhunter's creation. It also had mounting points for two concussion missiles, though they were not included as standard. This meant the Z-95's armament during its first years was… subpar. That didn't last long though, as the Z-95 was quickly updated to include a linked set of tame and back laser cannons a deal that would prove to be quite long-lasting, as Incom would continue to source laser cannons from the renowned weapons manufacturer for the rest of the company's lifetime. 
The new primary armament was also paired with an optional new secondary armament of two Krupp's concussion missile pods, giving the fighter access to far more firepower than it otherwise could have carried. It also had an optional hyperdrive package, though this was a rather rare purchase. The Z-95 had decently high commercial success after that. It served in many planetary defense forces as a mid-range patrol fighter, and it performed this role well. Its real success, though, came during the Clone Wars. The sheer number of fighter craft needed by the Republic Navy created huge opportunities in the starfighter market, and Incom capitalized on it by creating a bespoke variant of the Z-95 specifically for the Clone Army, which swapped the four smaller engines for two massive ones, and switched out the concussion missiles for torpedo launchers. This model saw extensive use in the latter part of the Clone Wars, being particularly favored by commanders in the Outer Rim sieges, where their high durability and well-rounded characteristics made the fighter a flexible asset, capable of responding to unpredictable or changing threats over the course of long campaigns. After the Clone Wars, the Z-95 continued to see widespread use, though not in the same way as before. The Z-95 was still favored by planetary defense forces, but thanks to the rise of the Empire, those were becoming less and less important leading to a shrinking market. Plus, the Z-95 was a durable and long-lasting fighter, so planets that already had some had no need to buy more unless they were growing their forces or replacing combat losses, incidentals that became less and less frequent as the Empire grew. The Z-95 was also not included in the Imperial Starfighter Corps in any meaningful capacity, being entirely subverted by Sinar's TIE Fighter line. All these factors together led to the Z-95 gaining a new reputation, as the fighter of choice for rebels and pirates. Their durability, ease of use, popularity, and firepower making them perfect for insurgent operations. Indeed, until the acquisition of the X-Wing, the Z-95 was one of the most common fighters of the Rebel Alliance, a fact which I'm sure gave the engineers at Encom at least a small sense of pride, given how much they despised the Empire. Back to the Clone Wars, though, the Headhunter was not the only fighter Incom made for the Republic Navy, or even the most famous. That title goes to the ARC-170, Aggressive Reconnaissance Fighter. This frankly massive fighter had three seats, one pilot, one co-pilot, and one tail gunner, as well as a full-size astromech slot. It was armed with two large medium laser cannons, two rear-facing light laser cannons, and proton torpedo launchers, as well as formidable shielding and a built-in hyperdrive. The fighter was originally designed as an outrider, going on deep space patrols and scouting systems nearby to Republic fleets as a way of extending their observational bubble. As such, the fighter was equipped with extensive scanning systems, communication systems, and life support systems for long operations. But unlike other scout craft, the ARC-170 was not intended to just run away if it encountered the enemy. Instead, it was well armed, more than enough to attack and destroy any enemy scouts it might come across, as well as perform hit and run strikes on larger targets should they be found in a vulnerable position. It is often argued that the ARC-170 was a poor reconnaissance ship, as its large size and lack of any stealth technology prevented it from observing enemy positions for any length of time, which is a very necessary trait for a true scout ship. But by seeking and destroying enemy scouts, as well as forcing enemy fleets to always keep their defenses up or risk being destroyed by a rapid strike, the ARC managed to harass and blind the enemy while also gaining intelligence for its own side, meaning the ARC-170 really was an aggressive reconnaissance fighter. That wasn't the ARC-170's only role, though. Its firepower and durability meant it was often used by the Republic as both a heavy space superiority fighter and as a strike fighter. Both of these are roles the ARC wasn't really designed for, and while it did perform them well enough, for the most part, it was terribly inefficient. The ARC was slow, and a very large target, and while it was durable, it wasn't durable enough to wade into large formations of droid tri fighters without suffering severe losses. And every time an ARC-170 was lost, three trained crewmen died. Those kinds of manpower losses were not something the clone army was capable of sustaining which seriously limited the usefulness of the ARC-170 at a strategic level. Partly because of these limitations, when the Empire took over and the clone army was disbanded, the ARC-170 was retired from service, and thanks to the relatively short production run, as well as the high cost of the fighter, precious few were located anywhere outside of the Republic Navy. So when the Empire scrapped everything they had left, there were almost no ARC-170s left in the galaxy. A few made their way into the hands of the Rebel Alliance, looted from abandoned clone bases or lost carriers, but the Alliance considered them to be too personnel-intensive 
as well as too expensive to maintain and dangerously slow, so they saw limited use. It really is a shame, because the ARC-170 might well have been the prettiest starfighter ever built, and many of us would have loved to see it some more. Its legacy did live on, though, as after the Clone Wars, when MCOM was working on its next big project, they used many lessons from both the Z-95 and the ARC-170 to help them design the best all-round multi-role starfighter the galaxy had ever seen. The X-Wing Starfighter is perhaps the most iconic fighter in the Star Wars galaxy, and for good reason. Its balance of sleek and utilitarian aesthetics, along with its distinctive X-shaped S-foils, make it instantly recognizable by nearly anyone who sees it. And besides that, it is the most capable multi-role starfighter in the galaxy. The X-Wing is a one-man, one-astromech fighter, equipped with a Class 1 hyperdrive, moderate shielding, decent armor, life support systems, and somewhat powerful engines. It is well-armed, sporting four Tame and Back laser cannons mounted to the tips of its S-foils, as well as two proton torpedo launchers mounted in its chassis. This all adds up to a very balanced starfighter, with good speed and maneuverability, as well as high durability and firepower, making the X-Wing the total package. In fact, the X-Wing was so well-rounded that it very much became the default answer to any problems the Rebel Alliance ever faced. Need to do some scouting? Send the X-Wings. Need to screen enemy fighters? Send the X-Wings. Need to strike a ground target, destroy Star Destroyers, send the X-Wings. Dogfighting, escort duty, patrols, infiltrations, send an X-Wing for every mission and call it a day. The X-Wing could handle any mission it was assigned, and while it might not be the best tool for the job every time, it's at least an acceptable answer. And that flexibility made all the difference for the Rebel Alliance, and later, the New Republic. The Rebels first gained access to the X-Wing in its T-65 variation. Although after the rescue of Incom's technicians and engineers, the design was quickly updated to the T-65B, which was slightly faster and easier to produce in the Rebels' secret factories. This is the most well-known version of the craft, being used by Luke Skywalker during the Battle of Yavin, as well as Wedge Antilles at the Battle of Endor, and practically every other Rebel pilot you can think of during practically every other battle you can see. The design was so good, in fact, that it would outlive the Rebel Alliance, not being replaced as the light side's main starfighter until well after the formation of the New Republic. And even then, it was replaced by another X-Wing. The T-70 was the direct successor to the T-65B, incorporating more advanced engines, shielding, and weapons guidance systems. This increase in complexity did result in an increase in manufacturing and maintenance costs, but the New Republic in its early days had the cash to spare. The T-70 would see fairly limited use in the New Republic, though, as that government quickly adapted to a peacetime footing after the fall of the Empire and the Battle of Jakku, and that left very few missions for the T-70s to perform. The New Republic also engaged in massive military downsizing after Jakku, slowing or stopping almost all of its warship production, since it had no clear targets to fight anymore. This didn't actually affect the production of T-70s as much as other projects, since the New Republic's vision for a smaller military actually did involve decentralized squadrons of snub fighters, serving as the main defense against pirates and the like. But the T-70s did see a reduction in numbers because of this, and it didn't actually get a chance to shine until cast-offs from the New Republic Navy found themselves in the hands of Leo Organa's resistance, fighting against the rise of the First Order. The New Republic's downsizing didn't stop income completely, though, leading to the development of the T-85, the most advanced model of the X-Wing to date, with even more advanced shields, guidance systems, and flight assist computers than ever before. By all accounts, it was a venerable starfighter, maybe even the most powerful starfighter in service at the time of its deployment, but it never got the chance to prove it. The majority of T-85s in New Republic service were stationed at Hosnian Prime and 34 ABY, when Starkiller Base annihilated the system. In this one strike, the fighter was practically wiped from existence, with only a handful of examples surviving in scattered facilities. Some of these were recovered by Leia's resistance in the period after the Battle of Crate, but for the most part, the T-85 was lost and never saw true combat. Speaking of the T-85 and the T-70, now would be a good time to mention what happened to those engineers and technicians that were either rescued by the Rebellion or managed to escape Imperial capture on their own. See, technically, Incom was nationalized by the Empire, and it remained in operation making mediocre starfighters under Imperial guidance until at least after the Battle of Endor. So all those Incom defectors needed a new name to call themselves by. The name they settled on was Freetech. Freetech, for the most part, simply manufactured the X-Wing during the Galactic Civil War, though they also developed a starfighter of their own, the E-Wing. This fighter was seriously good, and while its presence in canon is certainly less pronounced than it was in Legends, I am still very grateful to see it make an appearance in the Ahsoka TV show. 
the E-Wing was a very capable starfighter. And while we don't know exactly why the T-70 was chosen over the E-Wing as the successor to the original X-Wing, we can assume it has a lot to do with cost. Back to what we do know though, after the fall of the Empire, the engineers of Freetech wanted to get their old offices back, maybe even see a few friends that didn't make it out from under the Empire's thumb. So they offered Incom the opportunity to merge, bringing all the old designers back together again and breathing fresh life into the older company. Incom eagerly accepted, and the new merged company was creatively named Incom Freetech. This is the company that actually made the T-70 and the T-85. They became the primary provider of starfighters to the New Republic, and in their new form, they ensured that the legacy of Incom would outlast at least three galactic governments. This has been yet another episode of our series covering the various starship manufacturers of the Star Wars galaxy. If you have a company you want us to cover, or even just one specific ship, let us know in the comments down below. Also, we're still pushing for the coveted status of YouTube partners, so please share this video with anyone you think will find it interesting, and if you haven't already, subscribe. It'll really help us out. We still plan to make more and more videos covering various lore type topics, so be sure to check back every week to see what's new. Until that time though, I've been Austin, and this has been College of Lore. Thank you for watching.